So, my name is Sarah. I've been in San Francisco for about two years. I've worked at two startups so far. And so the talk tonight, I work at Insightly now, but I'm actually going to talk about data that I used in my last company, which was Causes.com. Um, I don't know if you guys know Causes. It was a Sean Parker company that, um, it was a social networking platform for activism. So, and um, <clears throat> at the end, I'll talk about why I'm, why I'm using Causes data instead of Insightly data, because <laughs> that will be relevant. Um, so, first of all, um, why would you do a cluster analysis or a user segmentation analysis? Um, <clears throat> you do this because you want to get to know your users, and that's good for a lot of reasons. Obviously, marketing, building your product, and optimizing for them. Um, I've never worked in finance, but there's a gentleman in the room who has, and he was saying that they use a cluster analysis at their hedge fund to actually uh, um, figure out price range for different loans, right? <laughs> yeah, so if you're interested in that, you can raise your hand or remain not on the list, but um, he had some really good information too. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it causes we did this for all of those reasons, but then also there was a sense in the company that we were building this product with sort of a, just a blindfold on. Um, our engineers never interacted one-on-one -on -one with customers. Of course, the marketing team does and the customer service people do, but the engineers, the executive team, and there are a lot of people in the company who just didn't really understand who we're building this product for. And so we thought it was really important to like bring some empathy into the company for our users. Um, and so we started this project. So first we'll give a, a data overview and then the methods we used and our results. <clears throat> so first, um, for a data overview, um, we at, at Causes we had a lot of variation in our data because we used Facebook Connect. So when people signed into Causes, they did it through Facebook and that gave us a ton of information on um, gender, location, their age and how many friends they have, a bunch of stuff like that. And I'm not sure if Facebook Connect still works that way, because this was a couple of years ago, and I know they were trying to tighten their funnels at Facebook and not just let everybody have their data, but for a while we could just download like tons of data from Facebook, um, and so we did that. And, and then our, we had our behavioral data from our own website, so since it was an activist platform, we knew um, who the most active people were, what kinds of topics they were interested in, whether it was animal rights or human rights or environmental justice and things like that. Um, so there was a wide variety of information there. And within our own um, platform, it was also a social networking site there too, so we could see how many um, connections each person had with other people on the platform. So kind of a influencer's sort of proxy. Uh, and then, to really round out the quantitative side, we did um, surveys and interviews, and then uh, with our qualitative research team, like the UX people um, uh, really helped with that, and the market research people. And then <coughs> we used um, third party sources to round out some of our information that we had on our users, and we used Rapidly. Do you guys, do, can you raise your hand if you have? heard of Rapidly or used it before. Yeah, I meant to look it up today um, because I haven't looked at it for a couple of years, so maybe you guys will know, but um, you can, you used to be able to give them email addresses and pay them and they would send you a bunch of information about those users, which seems like pretty shady. I don't know where they get their information. <laughs> uh, but we got back a lot of information, like income level, education level. So we had just on one user, we had a lot of different data that we could use. Um, for our analysis, which is super helpful for us. Of course, the public is like always biting their nails about that, and they're really nervous about us having so much data about them, but, um, but it made our analysis great. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, so anyway, Rapidly does still exist, and still exist. Okay, yeah, I wasn't, I meant to look it up today, I forgot. Okay, so first we started with um, the quantitative side, so we, we subset our users, we took a random sample of 200,000 users, um, and our entire user, ba user base was around 100,000 or something, I mean, excuse me, 100,000, um, 100, how much was it, 182 million, I think. Um, so we took 
200,000 users who had been active in the last six months uh, took a random sample of that we, and we just dumped all of that data that we got from Rapleaf and Facebook and then our own website and we put it through um, a k-means clustering analysis and that was because we needed to figure out how many clusters there were and just like kind of just generally figure out how what um, who went into what cluster and um, one thing about k-means cluster analysis is uh, a lot of people do an elbow test what's called an elbow test to figure out how many clusters there should be and so um, I'm just mentioning that quickly in case you want to do a k-means it's also helpful to look up an elbow test um, because it, it basically tells you um, for how many cluster for each additional cluster you have how much more information is gained in that cluster and so the line will actually at the elbow of the line is where you say okay like four clusters is kind of where we hit our maximum each additional cluster is not going to give us that much more information, so you want to stop at that elbow. So, um, so first we ran it through, and we figured out that about six clusters was our um, our optimized uh, cluster analysis. And once you have everybody split into a cluster, you assign them that cluster name, and then run it through a decision tree and use a random forest is what we used. Um, there are a couple of funny things about random forests. I mean, the pros of using random forests is they're really easy, and you can look them up online, and it's quick, and um, and it can do the job very quickly. But um, but <coughs> the they have a thing called importance that um, I haven't really been able to find a good definition of. So if anybody here has one, raise your hand and let me know. But um, Essentially, the k-means clustering, you're figuring out how many clusters you have, and then your decision trees, you want to know which variables are the most important for predicting who goes into which cluster. So, um, <coughs> so you look at the, the importance of this random forest. So it, um, in ours, like age was the strongest predictor of who ended up in which cluster. And then there were, there were 10 or 15 variables that were like the most predictive of each person ending up in which cluster. And we determine that with the importance, but um, it's just the bigger the number, the more important it is, but um, there's no real definition of importance as far as I know. Does anybody? Okay. <laughs> so I guess that's still the case. Um, okay, so then once we had everybody in their clusters and we knew which variables were most predictive, that was huge because then new people coming into the system who we've never seen before, um, we could kind of guess which cluster they would end up in just based on their characteristics and how similar they were to other people. So from that we built um, recommendation engines for what they actually saw on our website, and then we also, um, and then, um, gosh I just forgot what I was going to say, oh and then obviously marketing and advertising and things like that. But um, <clears throat> really we felt like doing the quantitative side wasn't enough. And so to figure out deeply who our users are and why they do the things they do, um, we sent out a lot of surveys. We had 1,500 responses. Um, and then from those, we picked um, 10 people from each cluster and interviewed them. So, well, it was roughly, I guess it was roughly 11. Um, and so we did 65 interviews. Um, really quick, this is just a visualization of a cluster analysis. So <clears throat> another kind of, um, another thing about doing a k-means cluster analysis is it, it finds the mean of each cluster, which is called a centroid, and then finds the distance um, of each user or data point, and, uh, and then starts to cluster them together. But you don't really, you can't really interpret um, what it means to be far apart. So these clusters are closer together, and so you just kind of magnitude or like generally know that these are you know more similar clusters than these two at the bottom. But there's no there's no real definitive way to say if these are like x distance apart and this is how different they are. It's just kind of but it gives you a good general um, idea of what's going on. So. This was five out of our six of our clusters. We had a sixth cluster that was um, 
that was kind of an undifferentiated category, so they're not pictured in this um, visual. What are the different color lines, and what do the lines represent? Oh, you know, actually, I, I'm not sure. It's been a while since I've done this. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> they look cool. <laughs> yeah, I know, this, this visualization, we did it in R, and I can't remember which package we used, which is such a bummer, because I'd want to use, I'd like to use it again, but I can't, so. Um, so, yeah. Um, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, so, when you do something like k-means, uh, it's highly sensitive to the distance metric you use, and especially given that your, your variables are so heterogeneous, like, you know, with different kinds of, some categorical even. Uh -huh. um, uh, like, what did you end up using as a distance metric? Oh, um, oh, geez. Um, off the top of my head, let's see. Somebody threw out some names, and I'll tell you which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of it off the top of my head. It was. Cosine, um, Euclidean. Uh, I mean, it might have been Euclidean. Kale divergence. No, I think it might have been Euclidean. Um, gosh, I have a white paper about it, and I. Um, was looking for it today and I couldn't find it. So yeah, sorry, but but there is a ton of information on Google when you are trying to figure this out. You can compare all the different um, distances and why you would use some and not others. So yeah, I don't have any information uh, in answer, but Google will have like a million. So yeah, just um, <laughs> try that. Um, okay, so here's an example of a decision tree. Uh, just the the data getting funneled down and then ending up in one of the clusters at the bottom. So then for the surveys and interviews, we had our market research team and the UX team go out and they really hustled. I mean, I thought the quantitative side took forever, but they really um, put in a lot of work. So, you know, understanding why people use your product, um, and what, you know, we really want to know, what do you do beyond, like, our product? Like, what's your day-to-day -day life like? Like, how do we really fit into your life? And, um, and then we ended up with these personas that, um, you know, internally, the, we call them, I mean, externally, we call them ambitious activists, practical activists, and we have all these, um, these um, characteristics on the side over here. But internally, we actually drew pictures. Like we had an artist who worked with us, and he actually drew faces, and we gave them names. Um, like, I think the um, self-assured millennial, because they, they're mostly male and they're young, we call them Zach. And these, um, <laughs> <laughs> these like this tenacious activist. This is actually your. It's your like really spammy grandmother and we called her Mildred um, because it was like really stuck you know so once we had like the faces drawn and the names given I mean the engineers and the exec team and every other company was just like okay like these are our people this is who we're building this product for um, so it was really helpful to be able to talk about our users and their needs um, and to have everybody really understand so and, um, oh, and then, so I have to leave early tonight because, um, because I have an early flight tomorrow, so I have to go pack. But anyway, just write down my email address if you guys have any questions and I'm not here um, at the end of the night. But um, really quickly, why I wasn't showing Insightly data tonight is, um, is because we, I did this at Insightly when I first got there. I was like, oh, let's do this cluster analysis. It was so cool, it causes. Um, but one thing is you, you can't really do a cluster analysis if your product doesn't have um, a lot of variation in its in like what your users can do. So um, Insightly is a customer relationship management tool and there just aren't, at the time when I started it was still very new and so we didn't have that much stuff that people could do. So everybody um, kind of fell into one cluster. <laughs> and I was like, why does this keep happening? And it was just because I the, there's not a variation in the data. And um, I know a lot. Of, I have a lot of friends who I've um, talked to who've had this problem too. And it's really a matter. Of, so if you try to do this in your company, and you keep ending up with like one cluster or a bunch of overlapping clusters. Um, that's why it's just there's just not enough variation in in the data that you have. And so you know you could always get more variation by. Um, 
getting rat leaf for you or whatever else, <laughs> like outside data. But anyway, so that's um, that's it. Yeah.